Chapter 8, House of Lords MRS Jenkins and Jessica Cave were walking down the corridor on the 8th floor of the Mayborn Tower. Jessica was a young woman with less than 30 years old, white skin, short height and thin, although her face had cheeks a little fat or chubby. She was not exactly a beautiful girl, but neither was she ugly, and her face was that of a sweet and nice person. On the contrary, MRS Jenkins was a middle-aged woman, a little obese and with a stern face, permanently with a watchdog gesture. MRS Jenkins dressed like a businesswoman, but with an austere style, with pants and jacket, in dark color. Jessica was wearing a short skirt slightly below the knees, a white blouse with a small neckline and a jacket, the skirt and jacket were gray color, and she wore shoes with a slightly high heel. The girl had a folder with papers under her arm and her face showed a gesture of cheerful enthusiasm. Jenkins and Jessica briefly greeted the secretary who had her desk a few steps from the door of her boss's office. Both women approached the door, and then Jenkins stopped and turned around to see Jessica's eyes. Miss Jessica, I think I do not have to tell you how important this job is. As director of the Department of Communication and Corporate Image of the Mayborn Corporation, I have under my command a very competent team with dozens of highly qualified professionals. Among the members of that team, I chose you, a young woman with little experience but with great enthusiasm and up to now reasonably effective. That's why I hope you do not disappoint me, said MRS Jenkins with a serious tone and a cold expression on her face. I understand, and I appreciate it, MRS Jenkins, and I assure you that I will not disappoint you, Jessica answered sweetly and enthusiastically, like a girl eager to please her stern mother. No. Miss Jessica, you do not understand it completely, behind that door is the person to whom I have to answer directly, and if you do not fulfill your work satisfactorily, that person will make me responsible for having chosen to you. And I do not have to say that if I have serious problems, yours will be worse. So, you should not fail, you will not do it, said MRS Jenkins with an intimidating look. No, no, ma'am. I will not, Jessica said nervously as if she were afraid. Jenkins saw her a few more moments, with an intense look, as if trying to find signs of error or a lie, then she allowed herself to sigh and knocked on the door of the office and received permission to enter. On a metal plaque above the door was Emily Palmer, Chief Operating Officer. Upon entering they saw Emily sitting behind her large desk, her head bowed and her eyes focused on the papers she had on her desk. Jenkins and Jessica walked and stopped, standing in front of the desk. Jessica wanted to open her mouth to say hello, but Jenkins gave her a discreet signal to keep quiet. Both women continued to stand in silence, in front of the desk where the third woman was apparently concentrated reading her papers. Jessica caught a glimpse of MRS Jenkins, who seemed imperturbable with her guard dog's face her gaze fixed at some point over Emily's head as if she see the wide view of London that could be seen through the wide window. Then Jessica saw the woman sitting behind the desk, that woman who seemed to ignore them as if they were not there. A couple of minutes later Jessica was nervous, while MRS Jenkins suppressed a small, ironic smile. Jenkins knew Emily too well and knew that this was a tactic she used to make people nervous, especially her subordinates. So you're Miss Jessica Cave, the one chosen by MRS Jenkins. Emily said finally raising her head to see them, while she pushed the documents aside with one hand and removed her glasses with the other hand. MRS Jenkins considers you a very talented person, it seems that you are the young promise of the Department of Communication and Corporate Image, she added with an intense look. Thank you very much, MRS Palmer. Jessica began to respond. I prefer MRS Emily or just ma'am, Emily said, expressionless. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate the trust you and MRS Jenkins have placed in me, replied Jessica, affectionate and a little nervous. I have read your file, which MRS Jenkins sent me, two years ago that you graduated from the university with honors and almost immediately you started working in our company, and during this time the evaluations of your work have been excellent. You are the ideal one to work as, the communication and image consultant of my future sister-in-law, 
Emily said with a frown when she mentioned the word sister-in-law, as MRS Jenkins has had explained to you, you are quite close to her in terms of age, well, at least more than the rest of the employees in your department, and obviously you two have in common that you are women. Two young women, practically from the same generation, you should understand each other better, in such a particular context, she added. You are right, ma'am, and in fact, I have already thought of an action plan to promote the image of Miss Victoria. I have some work schemes and ideas for her first public appearances, here I have some sketches. Jessica said searching her folder anxiously and enthusiastically, of course, I can also make a virtual presentation, and if I may. She added, eager to impress the powerful woman. I'm sure your ideas are brilliant and I'll gladly check them, later. Emily said with a wave of her hand for the girl to stop, but now I would like to tell you about the other part of your work. I need you to be my eyes and my ears. I will be direct and honest, I need you to inform me of all the facts of my sister-in-law's life, I need you to tell me, who she is talking to, who she is related to, especially if they are men. I need you to tell me what she is doing all day, where she goes and with whom what she says when she talks to you or with other people, what are her ideas and preferences. I need to know if she has vices and what they are. Anyway, tell me everything you can find out about she, working in intimacy with her, said Emily with her eyes fixed on Jessica's eyes. Jessica saw Emily and then MRS Jenkins in disbelief, rather bewildered. Excuse me, MRS Emily, do you want me to spy on your sister-in-law? Jessica asked nervous and surprised. Well, you do not need to name things, right? What you need are facts. Miss Jessica, you are at the beginning of your career and you can have a bright future in our corporation, you can climb the promotion ladder in your department, but I do not have to tell you that for that it is essential to have the confidence of the right people, that is, of MRS Jenkins and above all of me. We can boost your career a lot, but you should also know, that if you fail in our corporation and leave here without good recommendations, well, that can be a major obstacle to your career, in fact, could block your career at least in Great Britain or even throughout Europe," said Emily so calmly and friendly that it did not seem a veiled threat, although the intention was obvious in her words and in her gaze. Jessica saw MRS Jenkins looking at her with an intimidating gesture, and then she looked at Emily again and she understood another reason why Jenkins had chosen her, she was susceptible to being coerced and was ideal to spy on Victoria. On the other hand, it is not something so serious. I am simply concerned about the welfare of my brother and therefore of the corporation, and I want to make sure of the suitability of Miss Victoria. And of course, your fundamental task will be the to advise her in terms of image and communication, but in a secondary but essential way you will do what I have asked and through MRS Jenkins, you will report to me regularly. Can I count on you?" Emily said in a more severe tone and with an inquisitive look. Jessica just needed a few moments to respond. Yes, ma'am, of course, Jessica answered trying to hide her discouragement. The next day, in a very spacious and comfortable room of a private hospital, a luxurious room to be a room in a medical center, Victoria's mother rested in her bed. Then Nancy entered the room and greeted her cheerfully. Victoria told me that the room was very beautiful, but I think she fell short, it really is a big improvement over the NHS hospital's room, right, MRS Louise? Nancy asked enthusiastically while sitting on a chair next to the bed. Yes, I recognize that the room is like a hotel suite it is even better than the hotel suite where I spent my honeymoon. And the staff is very friendly and the service excellent. Victoria and Kate were accompanying me for several hours today, Louise said kindly. Then they both talked animatedly for several minutes until there was a pause. Nancy, I told Victoria to tell you to come, besides because I'm always glad to see you because I want to ask you a special favor, you know I love you very much and I trust you. You've been friends with Vicky since you two were little girls and I've seen you grow. That's why I ask you. I beg you to keep me informed of everything that happens in that house. I want you to watch Victoria and especially Lord William, 
I want you to see everything that happens between them especially after the wedding. I want you to be my eyes and my ears to know what happens between my daughter and that man, Louise said as she held Nancy's hand and saw her intensely in the eyes. Louise, do you want me to spy on Victoria and her husband? Nancy asked nervously and a little uncomfortable. Nancy, you love Victoria as a sister, and I am her mother and I love her more than anyone. I need to know that my girl is safe, I need to protect her. I cannot trust that man, the fact that I had to accept this madness does not mean that I trust him, I cannot help but suspect the intentions of that man, I really do not know what he intends with all this, said Louise serious and worried. I know that you are absolutely right, and certainly I also believe that all this has been implausible, crazy, but MRS Louise, it really seems to me that Lord William is not a bad man. It's true that I do not know about him enough, I cannot judge him yet, but what I've seen of him makes me believe he has no bad intentions about Victoria, anyway, of course, I'll always try to protect Vicky and I will never be passive if I see that someone tries to hurt her, you know, but what you ask me, MRS Louise, is that I spy on them, replied Nancy. Nancy. I do not ask you to do something indecent. I simply ask you to do what I cannot do myself, which is to take care of my daughter. There's nothing wrong with watching what happens, watching to make sure that Vicky is not in danger. Although it seems weird, Nancy, despite such abnormal circumstances, I also have the feeling that this man is not so bad or dangerous as I originally feared but obviously I cannot be sure and sometimes under the guise of a charming man a dangerous madman hides, and his plan with Victoria awakens me distrust, that's why I beg you to do what I ask, for me and Victoria, Louise said gently, squeezing Nancy's hand. It's okay, MRS Louise. I'll do what you ask, Nancy replied affectionately. Three days later Victoria was finishing dressing, makeup and hair in Albert and his husband Emerson's beauty salon, her accompanied by them and Nancy, Harriet and Kate. Everyone else was watching her dressed in an elegant suit and high-heeled shoes, and they praised her. You look like a dream, Vicky, said Harriet with a lovely smile. Certainly, you look beautiful, Victoria. I think Lord William will be very proud of you, said Albert, as would speak Victoria's best gay friend which was in fact what he was becoming. Thank you, thank you very much, said Victoria with a certain embarrassment, a sweet smile and a nervous attitude. Are you scared, Vicky? Nancy asked affectionately. Yes, Nancy, that meeting makes me nervous, Victoria answered fearfully. You do not have to worry, Victoria. I think you have a natural, innate sophistication, and I'm sure Lord William knows how to appreciate it, and that's one of the reasons why he likes you. And, you have to get used to it because this will be your life from now on, Albert said sweetly. Al is right, sweetie, you are an innate star, and with a little effort you will overshadow all those women of the high society, Emerson said cheerfully. Thanks, Emerson. Albert, you too give me encouragement, Victoria replied. A couple of minutes later Jessica entered the beauty parlor. She had met Victoria a couple of days before, and immediately she had proposed to Victoria's activity for that day. Jessica told her that they should leave now, that driver Joe was waiting for them outside with the limousine. Lord William must already be arriving, he had to go directly from the Mayborn Tower. Miss Victoria, said Jessica who was sitting next to Victoria in the wide compartment of the limousine. Jessica, I already told you that I would like you to call me simply Victoria or even Vicky. After all, you're only a few years older than me, Victoria said with a warm smile. Sorry, Victoria, it's just that working with MRS Jenkins and MRS Emily I've gotten used to dealing formally with my bosses. You can call me Jessie if you want, Jessica said with a smile. Okay. Jessie, Victoria replied cheerfully. Jessica could not help feeling sympathy for that lovely young woman, and she felt guilty for having to be a spy for her sister-in-law, that she looked like a witch from a Disney animated film. 
and she prayed to God that the girl would not do anything stupid or inappropriate that her sister-in-law could use against her. At that moment she watched as Victoria wrung her hands and outlined a gesture of tension on her face. Are you nervous, Victoria? Jessica asked with empathy. Yes, being honest, I'm a little afraid, Victoria answered with a nervous giggle. You do not have to worry, everything will be fine. It is very simple, it is simply a small public appearance for the press to see you for the first time near Lord William. Remember the plan, the journalists will see you next to him, the images will be made public, they will begin to speculate about you, and then we will make a statement to the media and social networks. Everything will seem more authentic, a beautiful love story, that of a powerful and famous billionaire in love with a young student who stole his heart with its beauty, tenderness, and charm. We will try to control the news in our favor, said Jessica speaking professionally but with enthusiasm. I understand, but, anyway, I feel intimidated. I'm not used to this kind of thing, Victoria replied with some shyness. I understand, but we will be by your side all the time. I'll take care of you and Lord William will be with you to protect you, Jessica replied. The limousine went to the Palace of Westminster. Upon arrival, Victoria was guided by Jessica through security controls and protocol staff to the visitors' gallery of the House of Lords of the British Parliament and they took a seat. Lord William does not usually participate in the sessions of the House, much less talk, but as you know Victoria today is a special occasion, said Jessica in a low voice. After the speeches of two peers, it was William's turn. Victoria felt her heart speed up and her skin bristled when she watched him prepare to deliver his speech. And she felt a strange feeling of excitement at seeing him so elegant and imposing, so powerful, a feeling, of pride. William's speech was about a bill to amend a law to take additional measures to help children with mental health problems, handicapped or with rare diseases and their families, and to improve funding for programs for these children and their families, and scientific research in this regard. As a father that I was from a child with special needs, I know how important this amendment is. As a sponsor of a foundation dedicated to these purposes, I have known closely the suffering of tens or hundreds of families, but also the extraordinary courage and perseverance of these parents, their infinite love. But it is necessary that our society does not turn its back on these brave people, that we make an additional effort that for society as a whole is not so burdensome but for these people, it can make a big difference. We must support measures that are common sense, which has been made with the invaluable advice of those people who have either suffered this tragedy in their own lives or who have devoted their lives to helping those who have suffered it. Believe me when I tell you that when you see a special child or their parents in the eyes, you would have no doubt that any help is small and that the measures born of those who fight in the front line to bring hope and comfort to these families they are better than those that any bureaucrat away from that reality could devise. Victoria was absorbed in the emotional and very well-argued speech of Lord William, and her eyes filled with tears, because she knew that those words were born of William's pain for his son. Jessica, with a sweet smile, gave her a handkerchief and Victoria thanked her with her own smile. At the end of the session, Victoria and Jessica met with William in a hallway at the house. He was very kind, although in the gesture of his face the sadness was appreciated. I think it was a beautiful speech, it moved me, said Victoria sincerely and with a certain shyness. Thank you very much. I'm glad you liked it, said William with a sad smile. Then they went to a small room where there was a meeting with a snack for some parents benefited by the charitable foundation sponsored by William that helped children with special needs, handicapped or with rare diseases. William introduced Victoria as his fiancée to several of them and the atmosphere was very sweet and pleasant. At one point during the meeting, Victoria was conversing alone with the parents of a child who had a rare disease that partially disabled him, the child had been left in the care of other relatives so that his parents could attend the event. They were a rather fat lady, blonde, just over 45 years old, and her husband was a few years older than her, also very fat, and white skin and dark hair with enough grey hair. They were a working-class couple, but they wore their best clothes to look reasonably elegant for the occasion. 
both spoke to her of how much William and his foundation had helped them, and of the kindness and empathy of him, from the times before the death of William's son. I'm glad William finally found a woman to rebuild his life and start a new family, he deserves it because he is a good man. And I'm glad it's with a girl as lovely as you are, said the woman. Thank you very much, ma'am, Victoria replied, blushing and with a beautiful smile. And above all, I'm glad you're not the typical high-class stuffy girl, it does not even look like you came from a wealthy family, the lady's husband said sincerely. Robert! exclaimed the lady in a scolding tone addressing her husband. I'm not from a rich family. I come from a working-class family, Victoria said as she laughed happily as a funny girl, making the couple exchanged a surprised look. I already said that your accent did not seem that of an uptown girl, although of course, you speak very well to be a working girl, said the man, hurrying to clarify his appraisement before the fulminating look of his wife. In that case, I am more happy for you and for him. Lord William deserves to have a good wife with her feet on the ground that brings him back to life. The poor man has not recovered since his son, said the woman becoming sad. Did you know him, before the tragedy? Victoria asked curiously. The woman's face was covered with a grim gesture of sadness and compassion. Yes, and rarely in my life has my heart broken, as it broke when I saw William broken by the loss of the child, the woman replied with moist eyes. If you excuse me. I'm thirsty, I'll see if I get something to drink, water or whatever, said the man a little uncomfortable, while retiring. Men, sometimes prefer to go into a burning building instead to face an emotional moment, said the woman with irony, although I must admit that my husband has had a great deal of suffering from our son, she added sadly, but at least our child he is alive, and I thank God for that, and that way in which Lord William lost his son, that is so horrible that no father or mother deserves to suffer something like that, the woman said without being able to prevent tears from spilling from her eyes. He, he. Victoria could not find the right words to ask. Imagine, Victoria, imagine a father who has sacrificed everything he could sacrifice for the sake of his son, who loves him with an infinite and desperate devotion, who protected him as if he were the only being in the world that gave meaning to his life because it really was that way. And now imagine that they take the life of his son in the cruelest way, and that who did it is precisely the other person in the world who should have loved and protected him the most. Lord William was a man absolutely broken, destroyed, sunk in a terrible depression, on the brink of insanity, crying without stopping, did not eat, did not sleep. My heart broke again when I saw him a month after the death of the child, the poor man had lost so much weight that seemed almost skeletal, his beautiful face sunken and emaciated, his eyes sad and lifeless, absent. I know he was hospitalized, I know. I know he was also about to die because the pain was going to cause his death in a way or another. Oh Victoria, it is impossible to describe it with words. It is impossible to convey the image of what we saw, and it had to be worse for his family and close friends, they had to witness how that man full of happiness and vitality, despite the special condition of his son, was turned into a man broken by the pain that only wanted to die, and that he has never been the same again the woman said with her voice broken by emotion, with tears coming out of her eyes. Victoria's eyes were also full of tears and she saw William in the distance talking animatedly with other people, and fortunately, he did not turn around to see her cry. I only hope that you can return that happiness and vitality, that desire to live, said the woman taking a handkerchief from her bag to dry her eyes. I... I hope so to it. Victoria said drying her tears with the handkerchief Jessica gave her, feeling guilty because she was afraid it would not be like that. When she left the event with William, he asked her if she was okay because he saw Victoria's sad look and compassion. Yes, of course, it's just, been an intense day. Thank you for inviting me, Victoria said sweetly. Thank you for joining me. Can we get out by holding each other's hands? It's part of Jessica's plan for the press photographers to shoot it when we're boarding the car, said William charmingly. Yes, of course, 
Victoria replied with a smile as she took his hand, and then she blushed. They both climbed into the limousine holding hands, while some surprised photographers captured some images of the famous Lord William Mayborn and his mysterious and young female companion with whom apparently had a love relationship. Upon returning to the house, William chatted with Victoria and Nancy for a few minutes while they drank coffee, but then he excused himself because he was tired and retired to the big house, while Victoria and Nancy continued talking in the guest house. Victoria told Nancy all the emotions that awakened the intense day, the pain and compassion that she felt for William's tragedy, and how she wanted to talk to him, to understand and comfort him. Nancy advised her to go talk to him, accompany him, and try to get close to William emotionally. With some doubt and shyness, Victoria went to the big house, crossing the pool area, dressed in a simple dress and wearing flip-flops. As she had become accustomed in the time she had lived in William's residence, Victoria opened the door to the big house and entered with absolute confidence. As she approached the living room, she heard a plaintive cry and stopped immediately. Slowly and cautiously, Victoria stuck her head out and saw William sitting in an armchair at an angle that he could not easily see her. Victoria realized that William was crying like a child, in such a heartbreaking way that it could be touching a hard heart. The man trembled strongly, almost as if he had convulsions, and cried hysterically, his face reflecting all the pain of his soul broken by that old and bitter suffering. Victoria trembled and cried in silence feeling the desire to approach him and embrace him to comfort him. But at the same time, she felt self-conscious, intimidated by the lack of trust between the two. Victoria withdrew trying not to make noise so William would not listen and then she left the big house. When she went outside, Victoria raised her head and saw the dark night sky, her eyes misty with tears. And then a flood of images, terrible images of a night, a few years before, came to Victoria's mind. One night when a phone call woke up her mother and Victoria and she had to run out of their apartment, after leaving her sister Kate in the care of Nancy's mother. The vivid images returned to Victoria's mind when she and her mother arrived at the hospital in despair. The questions and the prayers, the moments of waiting with fear gripping their hearts, both tormented fearing the outcome of that fateful night, praying for a miracle. And then the blow the images of her mother broken by the pain, and she herself kneeling on the floor, crying hysterically, feeling the greatest pain in her brief life, a pain that choked her as if she lacked all the air, the pain of not seeing that beloved face again and feeling his warm hands, the pain of the loss of her father. Victoria was united to William in the experience of the worst and most mortifying pain, him for the tragic death of his son, she for the death of her father. That thin but solid thread that unites two people who have lived too much pain. With the images of the night of her father's death, taking over her head, feeling the oppression in her chest, Victoria entered the guest house and seeing Nancy broke down crying piteously, and dropped to the floor, sitting and with her back against the wall. Anguished Nancy knelt beside her, and stroked her hair as she asked if she had argued with William. He's suffering. He's broken and I could not comfort him. I should have hugged him and told him everything was going to be fine, I should, but I could not, Nancy. The night Papa died, Nancy, that night I needed they to hug me and Mama did, but the pain does not go away, it never goes away. He does not deserve it, Nancy. Nobody deserves it, nobody. Exclaimed Victoria crying almost hysterically and pouting. Easy sweetie. Easy. Nancy exclaimed hugging her. Nancy made Victoria lean against her chest and hugged and caressed her, cooing her as if she were a little girl, while Victoria kept crying in a heartbreaking way.